Uh, hello Claudia, even though I don't know you personally, I've enjoyed to watch your video and it's quite an interesting challenge to um, talk about the relationship between performance and technology. Uh, for me personally, it's not so much the image of the performer uh, as a machine, which is interesting to me, as a metaphor, I think it's a very interesting subject, but um, as a creator, as an interdisciplinary choreographer, and as a scholar who is based on empirical research and develops from practice-based uh, research, um, it's more interesting to me uh, what practically actually happens in the theater. So I'll try to get to this subject a little bit slightly different and I hope that this is useful uh, for us, that we have an interesting dialogue. Uh, so I'd like to start with uh, Kerstin Evert who is uh, an important reference for me. In the field of dance and technology, she published the first um, book on uh, what she calls a laboratory, dance and technology laboratory. And she, in her study, uh, has a very interesting approach. She refers in a footnote that technique etymologically goes back to the Greek techne while technology derives from technologia and is composed of techne and logos. So techne can be translated as craftsmanship or craft and denotes the knowledge of principles and methods involved in producing an object or accomplishing an objective. Technologia analyzes the conditions and reflects the impact of techne in society and thus refers to knowledge about techne. So what is really interesting for me is this discursive dimension in technology. A German philosopher Martin Heidegger has written an important essay entitled Die Frage nach der Technik in English it reads, the question concerning technology, which pursues an etymological approach and helps to clarify some essential aspects of the terms technique and technology. Heidegger, in essence, states that um, he, he, in essence, warns against a limited understanding and consequently dangerous use of technology. So for this reason he chooses his etymological approach and traces technique all the way back to Greek philosophy to recuperate a deeper understanding of the phenomenon. Due to the lack of understanding the essential nature of technique, humanity can fail to develop a free and emancipated orientation towards technology. So Heidegger states that the essence of technology is by no means anything technological and shifts the discussion from the field of technological specialists or engineering into the philosophical area. Interesting also is the stance that Heidegger takes towards artists. He thinks that the artist takes the world as it is and reveals it in accord with the Greek word aletaia, which literally means revealing or unveiling, which also the engineer or the technologist does, but in a very different way. Professor Zürn concludes that art's relationship with the world is, in Heidegger's view, different from technologies in that art is less concerned with measuring, classifying and exploiting the resources of the world than it is with taking part in the process of coming into being, of revealing that characterizes the existence. So this is very abstract of course, but if we go into one of the most fundamental technologies today, the industrial production of food, it becomes very clear. 
So Carlo Petrini, the founder of the University of Gastronomic Science in Polenzo and Colonna, Italy, states, According to the UN Millennium Ecosystem Assessment published in 2005, food production and transportation is now the main cause of pollution and gradual destruction of our planet. This should make us reflect. If it is true, as Wendell Berry says, that eating is also a cultural act, agricultural act, then good quality food that are produced in ways that respect the natural environment and local traditions can encourage biodiversity, equity and sustainability. Food is not only food, but also pleasure, culture, conviviality. The mediator of values and attitudes, a vehicle for realization and a catalyst of our emotions. With this awareness, we become co-producers rather than merely consumers. The consumer has to feel part of the production process with an awareness of the influence of their preferences, either supporting degradation or rejecting injustice and sustainability. Dr. Vardana Shiva, a renowned Indian physicist who later trained as an environmentalist and today directs the Line Seeds program of the Research Foundation for Science, Technology and Ecology, has been an impressive example of such responsible and proactive attitude. In 2004, the new seed licensing law in India threatened to entirely take the farmer's right to preserve their own seeds. Instead, every farmer would have to get a permission from a registering authority that licenses and registers seeds. Consequently, the farmer's varieties were intended to be made illegal. In other words, they would not be approved on the official lists and consequently would simply disappear to give way for a few licensed sorts of seeds exclusively sold by large corporations to the farmers. Perversely, these licensed seeds are in reality hybrid, non-renewable seeds, which have to be bought uh, every year and treated with large amounts of expensive chemicals. As a result, most farmers have to go into debt because they sell everything that uh, they were able to grow to pay back their loans. Dr. Shiva and the Nine Seeds Movement organized a nonviolent march across the country and succeeded in preventing the act from being implemented. Moreover, the Nine Seeds Movement has created 46 seeds banks in different parts of India, which have two important contributions. First, the seed banks make local seeds available and work fine for organic farming. Second, these seeds can help with climate change. I quote, So, in the state of Orissa, we have seeds that can help us deal with salt water and cyclones. In Bihar, where the Ganges River flows, we have rice varieties that can grow six meters tall to survive the flooding. In the desert areas, we have seeds that survive droughts. But the corporations are greedy and try to patent all this rich diversity. The best seeds are bred when scientists cooperate with farmers and the best biodiversity conservation happens when local community partners with taxonomists. The best organic farming happens when soil scientists work with producers. So I think from these examples it becomes very clear that the attitude towards developing technologies is what corresponds to the logos in uh, techni and logos and that this uh, dimension, discursive dimension, is actually what most matters, at least to me as an artist in the perspective Heidegger uh, recommends that we reflect uh, about uh, our practice, our use of technology and how we develop technologies, for what we develop technologies, and this can actually be part uh, of our performance. I probably would even go so far as to say it starts right at the conservatory, it starts at the university, it starts with the wrong kind of teaching. Um, 
I'll go back to reading from the PhD. Acclaimed Buddhist philosopher, poet and educator Daisaku Ikeda addresses this issue in his speech entitled The Fight to Live a Creative Life. In other words, to get into this realm that we were talking about, the realm of Logos. On the occasion of the entrance ceremony of Soka University in 1974, he starts with a very surprising affirmation uh, which we can apply to arts education. A university is not the result of a system or building program, but a product of determination and passion of young people seeking new knowledge and wisdom. First of all, determined young people must aspire to make their truth, to make truth their own. To help fulfill such aspirations, teachers and instructors will be found. And through the cooperative effort of students and instructors, universities will evolve. Fundamentally, the university begins with a thirst for knowledge and a love for truth on the part of the students. The atmos atmosphere of such thirst and love must prevail. A university without eager students is a university without life, a university in which the main purpose has been forgotten. The time has come to return to the origins of university education. So I think artists have a real important, really important part in the discussion about what technology, uh, what technology's role in society is. Later into his speech, Ikeda refers to social scientist George Friedman's book, The Power and the Wisdom. I quote, the word power in the title refers to human power to control the environment by scientific or technological means. Wisdom means to him the intelligence to harness this power and use it creatively for the welfare of humanity. It is important to acquire power, but the acquisition of power must always be accompanied by the development of wisdom. Wisdom is rooted in the souls of human beings. The way to acquire it is to follow the simple advice of Socrates, know thyself. This is the starting point for establishing a sense of human dignity, preventing the degradation of human beings into anonymous, interchangeable machine cogs. The essence of true knowledge is self-knowledge. This is the ideal of Soka University. Countless splendid university and research institutions in the world can give you power. But what have they done for humanity? The cruel emptiness and frustration of contemporary civilization are the outcomes of their kind of education. So, I will conclude that the image of a performer as a machine right, is very much the fear of the kind of technology that we're developing taking over uh, our social organization, our societies, very much in the way that we're actually assisting at the moment, what we call a crisis, in fact is more a financial crisis than an economical crisis. It's really curious that we had 50 years of peace in Europe, and even though we have bigger problems than in many phases, in the European history, which is the way we're organizing the technologies that we're using to exploit the uh, contributions of uh, European citizens every day, their work, their labor, I think has a lot to do with Heidegger's take on uh, technologies. The essence of technology is nothing technological. It starts in the universities, or even before, it starts in our education system, it starts with the values that we're representing. So for me, I'm not so much interested in cyborgian images or in digital doubles uh, and so on. I'm much more interested in showing in my own artistic work um, what kind of relationship we develop towards technologies in a very concrete way. How do we use new media technologies and what do we do with them?
So going into my own field of dance and technology of digital live performance, I would say, intermediate performance, uh, I'd like to, a little bit to talk about how we could use the word technology in a field that seems to reject technology traditionally. Um, an interesting term, the term improvisation technologies, became very popular with the publication of a CD-ROM in 1999 by the title William Forsyth, Improvisation Technologies, a tool for the analytical dance eye. As is well known, this interactive CD-ROM introduces the larger public to a general description of the movement principles underlying Forsyth's choreographic work and present a set of tools to generate new compositional material and structures, as well as tools for the reorganization of existing material and structures. It is significant that Forsyth choose the, uh, chooses the term improvisation technologies instead of improvisation techniques. As a choreographer who is not only familiar with Greek philosophy but employs its concepts and terms, for example in his choreography Eidos, Delos, 1995, Forsyth certainly wanted to emphasize the discursive dimension of logos which is implicit in technologia. In other words, what is it that gives birth to a technique? Which principles are taught and are used in a particular technique or here in improvisation? Interestingly, the subtitle of his CD-ROM, a tool for the analytical dance eye, indicates that teaching the movement principles used in the choreographies Loss of Small Details, 1991, and self meant to Govern, 1994, to his dancers was not only intended to generate the choreographic sequences in real time during the performance, but also as an archival tool for the restaging and analysis of these choreographies. So, I would like to go the other way around. I would like to state that from these uh, quotations, from this example, it becomes clear that the term dance technology can be useful to describe the outcomes of a practical choreographic work informed by research and theory, and vice versa, in the form of a meta-system. Here's the uh, dimension of logos again such as the ones developed by Laban or Farsight, or for that matter, by any dance professional developing such a meta-system. This perspective comes very close to the Oxford definition for the term technology, uh, which I have mentioned above, but not used in this video, in which the development of technologies is linked to the application of scientific knowledge, and vice versa, the new technologies advance scientific inquiry. The science in question here would be in the field of choreology, or in more general terms, dance studies. So I suggest a working definition. I'd say dance technology can be understood as a meta-system of the field of dance that allows for the development of the particular dance and improvisation techniques the documentation and analysis of creative work, or the teaching of its principles to students and professionals. To me, this um, definition, or this working definition, is really turning everything around, because if the logos in technology is the meta-system, so, the act of reflecting about our artistic practice, then software and hardware become tools in a process where they are simply used for choreographic ends as much as they influence choreographic uh, practice. So, there is a bi-directional uh, influence, a mutual influence between uh, the choreographic principles and the development of technologies, particularly for the field of uh, performance 
or we could say dance as much as theatre. So for digital live performance. So getting deeper into the field of digital live performance and the relation between performance and technology, I would like to quote from Johannes Beringer, who wrote a really interesting book in 2008 on different kind of technological environments for digital performance. So regarding interactive systems, Beringer has proposed uh, an ecological understanding of uh, these performance environments. He writes, Dance has always been a life expressive organism based on a fundamental physical sensory relationship to space and the world, to perception and cognition, and to subjectivity. If we retain an anthropocentric perspective from a biocentric perspective, movement can be studied in many diverse species and geographies of the world and these performance worlds inform the natural slash cultural environments of human dance practice. Digital dancing, decidedly not post-human, has nothing to do with the synthetic engineering of steps and movement phrases or with copying the motion of figure animation as Mass Cunningham appeared to do when he used live form software as inspiration for his recent choreography, but everything with the overall physical behavior of the system. Movement bridges organic and inorganic forms. It evolves as a coupling with technical expanded virtual domains. Contrary to the assumption of disembodiment often associated with VR and telematics, the interactive, interactive coupling always involves sensory synthesis in an expanded biofeedback system. It is the convergence of movement with the hyperplasticity of space enabled by multimedia interactivity in real-time processing that I define as an interactive environment. So what is important in Beringer, we find in other uh, books on uh, theatre ecology, for example, Bas Kershaw has written about the ecology of performance. He has linked uh, the ecological approach to performance systems and call them ecosystems. He simply says there are organic elements and there are non-organic elements in performance. And actually there, there always have been. For example, Loy Fowler, when electric light was invented, was a great pioneer of exploring this technology in performance. But uh, it was actually just another step in theatre lighting and in theatre performance, which brings another subject uh, to the choreographic work or to the work of artists uh, working with interdisciplinary choreography. How do uh, training approaches change and performing techniques change when we get the chance to use with a new uh, technological device? Right? For example, how do performers have to be trained when they have interactive systems and sensors at their disposal? So developing on this idea of digital live performance as an ecosystem which contains organic and non-organic elements uh, and different interactive strategies, different interactive technologies. I'd like to go a little bit into the research project and the digital performance, award-winning performance, uh, .txt, which we developed between 2006 and 2009. Uh, the project had central ideas, simple central ideas, based on this idea of an ecological system. Uh, for example, the first one is the Big Bang of artistic language, the birth of a gesture, a sound, an image and their evolution in relation to the performer throughout the whole piece. 
in TXT, images and body are one. Words are as important as gestures or images derived from words. They exist to spur strong reactions by their own value and movement. And motion is sometimes vital to captivate the imagination. The images, movements and bodies should rise above the screen and scenic space alike beyond grammatical, syntactic, semantic and semiological formulations. They constitute a dramaturgic, emotional, sensitive whole or ecosystem and should become a transcendental experience that can take you to another place towards another emotion and induce your particular kinesthetic experience. Another idea is considering interactivity as a medium itself. The interface between the performer and technology is explored as content. So the non-intrusive tracking of the performer by computer vision technology and the gestural interpretation algorithms along with the ability to simulate reactions through behavioral descriptors expand the concept of responsive stage towards a living-like environment where the performer is simply one of the components. The piece also aspires to reinforce the perception of real-time interaction with participatory content by the audience. .txt audiences are encouraged to revolutionize power structures through the subversive manipulation of the electronic media surrounding us, through sending SMS text messages just before the performance starts, this empowered SPECT actor can take part in the dialogue happening on stage by adding content to the interactive move environment. Physical simulations like particle systems, bird flocking or potential fields applied to topography and its evanescence to abstract communication symbols constitute the performance universe. Its evolution, behavior and emotions are determined by the performer's interaction with its, while it's keeping an autonomous emergent behavior. A uh, third important idea is the critical reflection of convergences between art and science in its social, historic and aesthetic dimensions is part of the performance itself. So centering the visual imagery in text and topography, .txt pays tribute to a plethora of great digital artworks, from installations to performances and electronic poetry, and all its forms that contributed to digitally explore these ideas. The Electronic Revolution by William S. Boris, 1971, serves as a dramaturgic base to develop the narrative structures along the lines traced above. In his essay, Boris identifies essential questions about the use and abuse of media technologies. Furthermore, he proposes artistic ideas as well as humanistic concerns that have been inspired the, uh, that have been inspiring the narrative dimension of the .txt project. Some of the compositional devices shared by many artists of, this, of his time are revisited, refined and transferred to other areas. His famous cut-ups, for example, can be compared to sampling techniques today applied to all kinds of fragments of digital and analog media materials. So, TXT was quite successful uh, in exploring the um, digital live performance environment as an ecological environment. And I've actually done a whole case study for my PhD thesis, uh, which was entitled Methodology for Bidirectional Transfer Between Contemporary Dance and New Media Technologies to, to go uh, deeper into this relationship between uh, performance and the role of interdisciplinary uh, choreography. Uh, for, for society. But actually what I found is that things move on incredibly fast. So 2009 to today, 
2000, uh, 2012, uh, we are already in a very different stage and the concept of uh, performance as ecological environment becomes more and more important to my research as much as um, for my artistic work. So to finish off this uh, video letter uh, to you, I'd like to mention two more projects. Uh, one is already getting to the end, it's called uh, TKB, Transmedia Knowledge Base for Contemporary Dance. It's a project which is interdisciplinary, was FCT funded. It's an international research project envisioning the creation and development of a knowledge base to document, annotate and support the creation of contemporary dance pieces in Portugal and abroad. A custom-built video annotator provides the technological tools for an innovative approach to documentation and archiving of the creative process and live performances of some selected choreographers, like Kruy Horta and myself, uh, João Fiedeiro. Simultaneously, the video annotator is explored as a creation tool in the choreographic process. A creation tool has been programmed and tested by the TKB team. And that actually was really fascinating to have a video annotator doing a lot of different things as a digital tool in your rehearsal environment. So we're actually living in a, technologi a technologically empowered environment as much as we collaborate with programmers who need our choreographic uh, input to develop. So it's not only just an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary uh, work, it actually has fused to a state that you could actually not separate who contributed what, because a choreographer, for example, who successfully wants to contribute to interaction design, has to do some programming work, I think, to, to understand what he actually is talking about with the programmers. And that, in turn, uh, comes from uh, analyzing what con, uh, choreographic uh, devices, tools, uh, parameters um, are similar to uh, programming and in the programming language, what kind of rules, the algorithms, have uh, correspondences to the artistic process. So, while you're building some uh, kind of glossary together to understand what you're actually talking about in this interdisciplinary teams, you're also uh, augmenting your own system, whether that is programming or whether that is um, interdisciplinary choreography. So the artist today in such an interdisciplinary team has a clearly social role of uh, humanizing, there's a chance of humanizing uh, the technological environment, right? Because with the social awareness and with the social uh, approach that definitely we have in our work, with our humanistic concerns, we can dialogue with people that don't have these kind of priorities, but definitely as human beings have them and develop them, and develop them through dialogue even further. Uh, the future project that I'll be involved in is called Investigation and Creation no, sorry, transdisciplinary research and creation in theatrical robotics as a territory of experimentation for social robotics development. So this research proposal addresses complex issues in the field of human-robot interaction and social robotics development. For example, how can a robot acquire social capacities such as evaluating the context of an interaction and make decisions accordingly to the circumstances or interact with the human being in a responsive way. The field of theatrical robotics lends itself to research these complex questions 
as it provides particularly favorable conditions. For example, theater venues today allow for precise control over every aspect of the environment, space, light, sounds, objects, video projection, performative action, etc. Second, contemporary performers are highly trained and skilled professionals who can contribute creatively to the exploration of interactive interaction systems and strategies. And third, the methodologies used by choreographers and theatre directors offer many interaction techniques with animate and inanimate performance elements that constitute an important body of knowledge to be applied in the context of human-robot interaction. So, when we're talking human-robot interaction, it's not just like humanoid robot interaction, which, is, uh, which has been done and doesn't interest me too much for performance. Um, it actually uses the term robot in a much larger uh, context, actually the artificial intelligent, uh, intelligence context, and it analyzes how, um, how human cognition and human perception can be used in a, in a socially responsible way uh, to develop uh, robots, which we can uh, see as partners in certain uh, performance ecologies and certain environments. And hopefully these in this investigation also would spread out to other more industrial areas uh, as a good example of um, social programming, if you want. Okay. So Claudia, this has been very stimulating to see your video letter has triggered off uh, a two months reflection on my part. I hope some of these thoughts can be useful for you and I'll be happy to send you the PA, uh, PA, PDF of uh, the PhD if you'd like to go a little bit more into some of the aspects um, and hope that you're doing fine with this material and do a great article. Thank you very much.